Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and we are at the start of our first full day of the Homeschool Plus Conference, our second annual event. Pat is the co-chair of this event. Welcome, Pat. Thanks, Steve. Pleasure to be here, as usual. Of course, so glad to have you here. Thanks to Homeschool Life, G3, and Home Education Magazine for support and promotion of the conference. And thanks so much to Blackboard Collaborate for this ever so stable platform. We are running an alternative education film festival this month. Now go to altedfilmfest.com. We've had two interviews so far, Herman Doyne and Kevin Soling, for their films. We've got more good films coming, five more films coming up. Please do join us. It's a new format and a lot of fun, a fun addition to the conference. This is a chance for those of you participating live to indicate where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for the star icon. You're going to click it twice and then click on the map. Looks like we have Serbia up. The films are challenging, aren't they, Peggy? <laughs> oh, look, nice international audience. Yeah, that's great. Please do keep um, letting us know in the chat where you're from. You can use that chat to comment or ask questions during the session. We'll try and shepherd those. Pat, I'm going to turn the time over to you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, why we need alternatives to school. We've accepted compulsory schooling as almost a given in our lives. And now we capture children at ever earlier ages and hold them on for even longer until they are adults. And we put them in these places called school, um, where their actions are tightly controlled, even their thoughts are controlled. And not only does it have an effect on children, it fills the families with schedules, anxieties, and issues that often place the needs of school over any individual's need. In fact, we've often heard this in, in the homeschooling community, that we're selfish because we have to give up our individuality for the group, that we should be participating in, as cogs in this giant machine, and that somehow we're not good citizens if we don't. But one of the reasons why we need alternatives to school is that our imaginations and our spirits learn to accept the limits of schooling as the limits of our lives, too. How many of us have been told we're not good at math, and then we spend our lives thinking that we're bad at math, yet we're able to make financial investments, follow the stock market, play computer games that involve money, yet we think that you know we're bad at math because we couldn't do trigonometry or something, some higher order function. But this stuff cripples us in some ways. It stays with us for many, many years, not our entire lives. So I want to explore some of the practical and philosophical issues about what is really important to help our children learn and grow in society if schooling isn't the answer. A few years ago, I mean, I started with this idea about having alternatives to school instead of alternative schools almost 30 years ago um, in conversations with John Holt. And one of the books that he wrote, I'm going to talk about more about this later on, is called Instead of Education. Because one of the things that, that tends to happen, and I'm sure this is happening to, to every speaker in, in this uh, conference over the next, over what's happened already in the, next, in the coming days, and that is they'll be receiving, you know, criticisms that what you're doing um, is impractical. What you're doing can't really help kids as well as compulsory school and all the money that, you know, our government throws at schools. However, 
John show, opened my eyes to all the other places. Like in 1976, he wrote this book, Instead of Education, about all these places where people who were, were considered failures in school or who didn't enjoy school, nonetheless decide to take courses like cooking uh, classes or Berlitz language schools or karate or some sort of martial arts. Why would they choose to do this, you know, if school was so offensive? It's because they enjoy learning but they don't enjoy schooling. Uh, you have to paraphrase Winston Churchill. He said something to the effect, I love learning, but I hate being taught. Um, there is a great difference you know, between you know, choosing to attend school and being forced to attend school, something that a lesson that we really haven't figured out and learned here. Um, a few years ago, gosh, I must be going back about four or five years now, um, I was speaking in Chicago, and Dr. Peter Gray was too, and we got together and we really hit it off, and we realized that we're, among uh, educators and um, alternative educators, we're not trying to push a particular philosophy, uh, although certainly living and learning is broadly defined by John Holt, it, I guess would be that philosophy. But I'm not trying to say that like a Waldorf school, there's a particular way that, or a Montessori, that there's a certain way you must approach a child at a certain age on a certain topic. What we said is like, how do we help people enjoy self-directed learning and get over their fear? Because this is something that we do from, from birth till death. Um, but it's masked by our participation in school. So Peter and I uh, decided to get together for lunch when we got back to Boston a couple of times and then uh, started to expand our circle to see who are other people that might be interested in this. And um, from this core group of people, we started alternativestoschool.com um, because, you know, I'm obviously completely entrenched in the unschooling, homeschooling world and uh, all the support services that go with that. And Peter was coming at it from an academic background at Boston College as the head of the psychology department, trying to, uh, you know, sort of like the scales had fallen from his eyes in the 80s when his son went to Sudbury Valley School, and he was like, wow, there's, there are all these other alternatives, and they're very effective. How do we get the word out? So since we've done this, it started with a core group of five people. Now we have many others. I know Maria is, is uh, one of the participants. I saw her name come across here. Lenore Skenazzi uh, uh, and um, the Laura, uh, Laura Grace Weldon just recently joined. I mean, we're getting more and more people coming on who realize that what we're trying to do is encourage people to be self-reliant, to use the resources that are available in their communities, and to show that there are other ways besides spending tons and tons of money on school and forcing children to be away from their families for longer and longer periods of time while they get instructed. Um, what we're, we're learning, um, although certainly alternative schoolers and many um, philosophers of education have pointed this out over the, the centuries, is that living and learning are entwined. They can't be separated. But we've done exactly that in school, which is why we need alternatives to school. The primary thing is agency. When a child is, 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 is born, they are putting everything in their mouth, they're babbling, they're looking, they're experiencing, they're feeling. The entire world is, 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 is being explored by them through all of their senses. And this continues throughout their life. Um, as you know, Peter Gray wrote in his excellent book, Free to Learn, um, Why Un Unleashing the Instinct to Play Will Make Our Children Happier, More Self-Reliant, and Better Students of Life. He points out that, you know, children, for most of human history, have educated themselves through observing, exploring, questioning, playing, and participating in adult society. You know, we've, we've done something odd with this concept of school, which arose out of the Industrial Revolution. Um, the school is a factory for learning is still a very powerful uh, metaphor that, that runs through schools of education and most adults' visions of how school works. But children need to move and explore the world around them in order to learn about it. So what 
exactly are these conditions? Because Peter writes, these educative instincts still work beautifully for children who are provided with conditions that allow them to flourish. Well, what are those conditions? Let's take a quick look at that. You know, for many years, John Holt, Ivan Illich, Dr. Raymond Moore, many people have been telling uh, parents to relax that you're, you know, living and learning are entwined. The world, you know, the curriculum gets created through your interest and your actions and that you, you will find your teachers and your mentors as you go through life and you, you are active in your pursuits of these things. These ideas get, sort of get um, amplified through research. Um, and it's really interesting how um, Dr. Alan Thomas, uh, a British researcher who studied 100 uh, unschooling and homeschooling families in New Zealand and Australia, He's written a couple of books. Um, you know, they're on my website. I forget the titles. I think one is called um, How Children Learn at Home. Um, but he summarizes how children learn through informal learning. And I thought this list was really good because it just shows you all the things that take place in, in an incidental learning, so to speak, in, in this informal setting. And if you look at any one of these these things, such as play, well, play has practically been eliminated from school. Recess and by making um, physical education, uh, again, something that's a course instead of a pleasure, something to do. Although good, good teacher, phys ed teachers know to get kids involved in games. You know, they do that just like good teachers know how to do that too in a classroom. That they know how to make things fun. But more and more, fun is considered a negative, and if, if anything, um, you know, our classrooms are, are getting less and less joyful. In fact, I'm going back now 10 years, but I, Dr. Thomas Armstrong, I had him at a conference in 2005, and he gave some really excellent talks. But one, during the one of his uh, talks about um, um, ADHD, he was talking about how he, at the time, when he did a literature search for the phrase joy in learning, he couldn't find any references. And um, I think that this may still be true, <laughs> you know, which is kind of sad. I mean, learning has just become a factory model. These ideas of observation, watching and listening. Well, how does that take place in a classroom? Certainly, if you listen to people like Chris Mercaliano talking about the uh, Albany Free School, if you get ideas or, or uh, by reading Free to Learn and what happens in some Sudbury Valley schools, you can see how the teachers have to cultivate patience, lots of patience to let this happen. But how can that be in a school where learning must take place at certain times and then be tested to make sure it's happened? So it's almost like the school structure that we've created is completely against all of these principles that we need to encourage informal learning, to in encourage children to converse with you, to have intellectual search, to respond openly to suggestions, they must first trust you. You must have a relationship with them that wants them to respond to your suggestions, or at least take them into consideration seriously, that wants them to have conversations. They want to do things that they want to practice. No one wants to practice the piano if they don't enjoy the piano. But if you, you know, so that's why I tell my piano students, you know, if you don't enjoy practicing, I give them ideas on how to make practice more enjoyable. But if they don't, maybe piano's not for them. Or maybe they don't need that many lessons. Maybe they want to take lessons once every three months. But, you know, once you're in school, you're going to have a lesson every day. And if you don't practice, you're going to get, you know, hurt. Because what I've noticed in this is students who, who, who like, they may switch instruments. Their parents wanted them to take the piano because they had a piano in the house, but they really wanted to learn the drums or the guitar. Other things, other kids, you don't, you know, I, I, like myself, my mother yelled at me, stop practicing, stop playing the piano. I drove them crazy because I loved it, you know, but that's because I had access to the piano and I knew <laughs> until I hit a certain point that my parents enjoyed hearing me play the piano. So, all these issues of informal learning um, th that we know work because they work 
all of us do this as adults outside of, of, of work and learning and often in work. This is how a lot of management studies show that people learn on the job. There's a lot of research about, about that, and even going back into the military in the World War II and the Korean War, where they studied how to take like these guys who only had high school degrees or less, and yet were able to learn to use complex um, missile systems and fly jets, fighter jets. And it was fascinating to me to read some of that literature. Was what they did was they used things like color coding. They used rhyme. They used all sorts of techniques to, to help bring people up to speed quickly. You know, you don't need eight years of reading instruction to learn to read. Um, what we've seen with incidental learning over and over again is when the, the child is ready to learn, they learn quite effectively and quickly. Um, I, I could give you some examples of this, but we, we might want to save those uh, for later for the uh, conversation. So these are the conditions, you know, and when children are able to use these uh, abilities, uh, which every one of us has, um, he's, you know, they learn. But what is interesting to me is it appears from this list that the main condition that learners need is freedom from adult interference and anxieties about their learning. You know, so much of a child's learning is hidden from view. And it makes us, and, and we adults seem to really want to be able to lay claim to that learning, that, oh, it was my effort that made my child learn how to write uh, this wonderful essay. I mean, we do take pride in that, and certainly we are part and parcel of their learning, but we need to have our children own their own learning. They need to feel good about it, too. And this is the problem, another problem with, um, you know, schooling and why we need alternatives to schooling. It's coercive. It's by law. You know, in, in America, we have compulsory attendance laws. Now, these laws force you to attend school and, you know, and there are ways around it. You know, like in England, I love the phrase education otherwise. If you're being educated otherwise, you can escape coercive schooling and, you know, and, and go to school at home or in some alternative situation. But, um, what we see is uh, children being forced at every younger age, down to two now in America, and being pushed up to 18, and being told that they need to go to school in order to learn. And then they get in this situation, and, you know, schooling that children are forced to endure, in which the subject matter is imposed by others, and the learning is motivated by extrinsic rewards and punishments rather than by the ch children's true interests. This turns learning from a joyful activity into a chore to be avoided wherever possible. Coercive schooling, which tragically is the norm in our society, suppresses curiosity and overrides children's natural ways of learning. It also promotes anxiety, depression, and feelings of helplessness that all too often reach pathological levels. These self-directed approaches have been used successfully by young people representing the whole normal range of personalities and diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. These approaches nurture such traits as initiative, creativity, playfulness, and love of learning. Traits that promote life satisfaction and are, and are increasingly essential for economic success in our rapidly changing world. As an added bonus, the financial cost of such approaches has proven to be far less than that of coercive school. And it's ironic that while we're, we talk about disrupting um, businesses, disrupting uh, education, and disrupting health care and so on, Healthcare costs keep going up and, and become more and more part of our lives, and schooling has. The cost of schooling has gotten ridiculous. I mean, now going to college is out of the range of so many people. Um, so, you know, we, we have to wonder what is going on by constantly forcing people? What's the logic of this? Is it more to serve the school institution and keep it subscription-based steady, or is it to help children learn? Uh, one of the most recent ones that we have now is, you know, I'm going to talk about these checklists in a little bit, but the Common Core Checklist of Learning. 
one of the most, con- well, it's not that controversial because many people aren't aware of it, but they've eliminated teaching cursive handwriting. You know, they feel keyboarding skills are more important. So by eliminating handwriting, they feel that, um, you know, we're entering the 21st century and children will learn keyboarding skills. But people need to sign their signatures. And, of course, I've read that, oh, that's not true, that now we have e signatures and PDF documents and email that you use instead. Well, okay, that's fine if you have access to a computer and, and so on, but many of these families do not. But the thing that really got me is uh, it was in CNN, and, I, and, and they turned this into a transcript so you, you can read this. Um, they, they were interviewing one of the promoters of Common Core, and one of the um, uh, interviewer pushed him about, well, how will children learn to handwrite? Because they need to take notes. They're going to be... You know, they're, they're not going to always have an electronic device and a keyboard near them. The man replied, they'll teach themselves. They'll learn because other people are doing it around them. It's really interesting how when it serves their purposes, the promoters of coercive schooling say, oh, no, kids don't need to be forced to learn handwriting. They can pick it up. But we know as homeschoolers that our children have all learned how to use a keyboard without being taught. In fact, many kids have taught their parents how to use a computer without them being shown specifically how to use a keyboard. You know, um, there, there's a real craziness about schooling and the logic behind schooling and about the needs of what we need to teach children all the time. Um, so, you know, coercive schooling is another reason why we need alternatives to school. And what would those alternatives be? Well, let me Let's talk about that for a second here. Let me talk about it, and I hope you'll join me soon. <laughs> you know, first of all, this is not a new idea. Uh, I learned, as I said earlier in my talk, I first learned about it from John Holt, who uh, actually wrote a whole book about it in 1976 called Instead of Education, Ways to Help People Do Things Better. And I've always liked that. It's not about improving your IQ or making you get more money because you've got X number of degrees. It's about how can we help you do things better, make you a better reader, make you a better employee, do, do what you want to do, make you a better piano player, make you a, a better mathematician. What a different approach. It, it's sort of, you know, to me, it, 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 the, the sorts of places that John talks about instead of education are places like Berlitz School. Well, I, I mentioned all that. And now, since then, there are more places that have come up. I have two on, on this uh, PowerPoint. Open Connections, which is a family-based um, learning center. Um, and then uh, North Star, uh, which is a, a, a learning center based for teens. And then here in, in Massachusetts, there's been an explosion of these places. Uh, we have the Macomber Center that opened in Framingham, the Bay State Learning Center that's opening here in Jamaica Plain. Parts and Crafts, which has been a, day, uh, a daily drop-off center for uh, homeschoolers now for a couple of years. Is, is this year seems to be really well organized and, and, and coming into its own. So we have a lot of support, um, a great variety of resources. And, you know, these resources also include democratic schools, of course, in which children direct their own activities and participate in running the school. But... I want to also get out of the school and, and move into society. And that's where places like Open Connections and North Star really shine, I feel, because they are, they're not just trying to keep everyone in their little facility. They actually have facilitators and, and uh, I hesitate to call them teachers, but, but uh, for lack of a better word, teachers who, when they work with students one-on-one, try to set up uh, things where they get out or move things into um, projects that these kids can do together outside of school, such as uh, I remember North Star had a whole video about them cleaning up Hadley, Massachusetts, you know, on, on one of their environmental uh, cleanup days. So there's uh, a whole bunch of, of ways of, of going about this, and it doesn't have to just be you doing it yourself and your family. There's a lot of support out there. And ever since we started AlternativesToSchool.com, there's been more. And this has been an important element in my work and uh, in the work you know, that I picked up from John Holt. He always promoted resource lists of homeschooling groups. And, yeah, some of them were exclusive groups to certain religions or certain educational philosophies, but we still want you to know about them. But as we promoted more and more of those, just as it's happening now, more and more services will come on. Schools like 
the Clon Lara School, which were just alternative campus-based schools, eventually expanded their programs to accept and enroll homeschoolers. And now there are many spin-offs of even that. Um, you know, self-design is, is a sort of uh, spin-off. There, there, there are many places. Um, in British uh, Columbia, the Purple Thistle Center that uh, I hope Matt Hearn spoke about it last night when he was talking at the conference. There are so many um, new ways to get out there um, and learn, but they're not all connected to school and they don't all use the same the, the school model. Um, but what I think is important is that these places give you the confidence to strike out on your own, you know, um, because at some point you're going to find that your child doesn't want to do uh, all these things or maybe doesn't have some of the offering, doesn't like the offerings at some of these places. You can create your own, and this is how we did it. We didn't have an Internet in 1981 when I started homeschooling. No one did. And yet, you know, our kids got into Harvard, not my kids, but homeschool kids got into Ivy League schools like Harvard and Brown and so on. Just loving a library card is all we needed back then, and that's all you still need to know, especially if you consider the Internet your library. It's an incredible resource. But there is a danger, too, that I, I want to mention about, you know, the Internet and about all these uh, ideas of, um, you know, having all these resources available. Uh, both Illich and Holt gave a warning about this that I think that, that we need to be careful of because in conjunction with this push to have more and more school, to push you know, compulsory school ages down to, to two years old and up to 18, and then to have mandatory continuing adult education. This is something that, that has been around for as long as I've been involved in the homeschooling community, and it's going to come back to bite us in, in a really big way, I think, as, as this concept that we can't learn unless we are taught and that you know, by having access to the Internet, now we can be taught through every screen in our life. But Ellis saw this, and Holt did too. And in instead of education, Holt writes, it is clear now, as it was not at first, why Illich reacted with such horror to my saying that we should push the walls of the school building out further and further. That seemed at the time a good enough way to say that we should abolish the distinction between learning and the rest of life. Only later did I see the danger that Illich saw right away. Think again about the global schoolhouse, madhouse, prison. What are madhouses and prisons? They are institutions of compulsory treatment. School is just this sort of compulsory treatment center. Society has decided that one group of people, teachers, shall do all sorts of other things to another group of people, the students, whether they want it or not. Until the teachers think the students measure up, know enough about the world to go out and live in it. Such people like to say, for example, that no one should have the right to be illiterate a right that I have at any time when I travel to a foreign country. A global schoolhouse would be a world, which we seem to be moving toward, in which one group of people would have the right to our entire lives to subject the rest of us to submit to various kinds of treatment, such as education, therapy, and so on, until we did. A worse nightmare is hard to imagine. So what, instead of more and more school, which is always the solution, you know, school seems to be the, the solution for everybody, um, but we know that, that school isn't the solution for everybody. We know that if your socioeconomic background is very strong and um, your parents went to college, you're probably going to do very well in school. But what really makes a difference to all those families that don't fit that bill? Well, money and a, a solid family. And by family, I don't mean your biological family, although that, that is in definition. I, have, I want to have the broadest definition possible because 
children need families to, you know, and a family may not necessarily be their biological parents. They may not be the best people for them, the safest people for them. But we need to figure out ways to have these extended families. Um, and, you know, again, homeschooling is, and unschooling are, are ways that I see this happening as people you know, share child care and so on and, and so on. But there are other examples. And then money. You know, money goes to school. Money goes to teacher education. But what about giving money to the community so that those families would have the money for proper health care, would always have secure um, a, a, a food supply, would always have a safe neighborhood? The children would, uh, you know, if their parents needed or, or their brothers and sisters needed some sort of services, they would have easy access to this, you know. Um, it seems that whenever we talk about, you know, money, it's like what, the, what you will get when you graduate college after you've paid off all your, your, your student debt, then you'll have money. But money is important now for families in order for them to learn. So we really need to, to pay attention to this. I heard on NPR yesterday about a study, and I don't know the name of this, but I hope some of you, you will find it. I'm certainly going to look for it later. Um, it was done in Baltimore, a 30-year study um, tracking 800 children from uh, their school years into their 20s. And what they found out, that what made a difference in all their lives were a strong family, people who looked out for them and cared for them, was, it, uh, was the broad definition, I, I believe, Strong families, support system, and money. That's what really made the difference in their educational outcome. Not really good teachers, not really expensive schools with fancy gyms and pools. So we need to really look closely at this. And again, this is not news. Ivan Illich wrote this in Deschooling Society back in 1971, studying UN studies and various studies from around the world. Um, there are so many books that, that, that have debunked the myth that education is the way to rise people out of poverty. As Ellis pointed out, school creates the classes. School creates poor classes and then puts up the, the children in there for, as adults for the rest of their lives. Um, there is no more class-based you know, class society than the education system. But you know, we act like it is a classless system, and you know that that is another problem with school. Is like if you do poorly in school, it makes you feel that you are going to do poorly in life. The teacher and author John Holt wrote this letter to Mothering Magazine back in spring of 1983 that I think neatly sums up this often unrecognized problem, which I think is the biggest problem caused by universal compulsory education. Um, the universal compulsory schooling, namely too much schooling creates stupidity. Holt writes, when I, now 60, was little, nobody ever thought that children had to be taught colors and shapes. Nobody ever taught me colors and shapes. I figured them out, just as I figured out thousands of other, thing, of other things by seeing what people did around me and hearing what they said about what they did, and maybe asking a question if I wanted to confirm one of my hunches. That's a very nice summary, by the way, of Dr. Alan Thompson's um, list of informal learning. Now let me go back to that right here. Every year, Holt writes, we get more and more deeply mired in the fundament fundamentally false idea that learning is, must be, and can only be the result of teaching. In short, that ideas never get into children's heads unless adults put them there. No more harmful or mistaken idea was ever invented. The fact, as all parents of young children can easily observe, is that children create learning out of experience, and they do it in almost exactly the same way that the people we call scientists do it, by observing, wondering, theorizing, and experimenting, which may include asking questions to test their theories. I suppose I'm doomed to spend the rest of my life battling it. The worst thing about it is that after a while, kids come to believe it themselves. Well, this is, um, I, I wrote this on my blog recently, um, and uh, I, I've been really thinking about this issue a lot because these these attitudes about education have really 
made uh, made us treat children differently than than we have in the past. Um, you know, Common Core is the latest checklist of essential knowledge for children, and that's full of concepts and facts that children, that teachers need to implant in the minds of students. And that replaces the No Child Left Behind list, which replaced the Back to Basics list and all the other curricular checklists of the last 150 years. But no one is asking what is the effect of, of this on children. And, you know, this checklist approach has the effect of infantilizing children in our minds and in the public policies that, that, that we initiate. And this reduces their agency. I mean, for instance, Holt observed this in, in his book, How Children Fail, about how children play all sorts of games. He called it the charade of learning in his classroom, where they try to get the teacher, they trick the teacher into giving them the answers. And, you know, Holt eventually said, this isn't, this is crazy, this game, and that most of the, the real learning that took place for kids took place outside of his class. So he realized that most of his work as a teacher, he decided probably around 1970, when he wrote Escape from Childhood, I get the feeling, this is when he decided to change his, his pack. Instead of trying to come up with clever ways of helping children learn in the classroom, he felt that it was more important that we figure out ways to help integrate children back into adult society. Another book um, that came out many years, just in 2004, that really impressed me on this topic is uh, Huck's Raft, The History of American Childhood by Professor Stephen Mintz. And he notes, Today, connections that link the young to the world of adults have grown attenuated. The young spend most of their day in, adult in, in an adult-run institution, the school, or consuming a mass culture produced by adults that have few ties to actual adults apart from their parents and teachers. Robert Epstein, who is a senior research psychologist at the American Institute for Behavioral Research and Technology, wrote in the New York Times just in July 5th, 2014, that our style of schooling not only infantilizes our children, but also children from other cultures when they are exposed to it. He writes, the turmoil of our teenagers is due entirely to societal practices that infantilize young people and isolate them from responsible adults, trapping them in the frivolous media-controlled world of teen culture. Anthropological research also demonstrates that when Western schooling and media enter cultures where teenagers are highly functional, they typically take on all the pathological characteristics of American teenagers within a decade. That to me is pretty remarkable. And also, uh, I hope you'll see the, the movie Schooling the World by Carol Black. You can see in this movie how this takes place in India. You can see how American culture through schooling is infiltrating Indian culture right before our eyes and turning them from, you know, children who are somewhat more, well, let's say, say more self-sufficient and more in tune with nature and the world into consumers who have no concern for nature and the world but are more concerned about their grades and how they look in school. Uh, John McKnight, uh, who's a brilliant writer about community, uh, I really recommend his book, The Mask of Caring. Um, but he has a, a website called um, the abcdinstitute.org, and he writes um, and works extensively about communities and how they grow and thrive. He noted in a conversation with my friend uh, Dan Grego, and it's really stuck with me, that no, that until about 150 years ago, around 1850, uh, no so human social group, a town, a village, a tribe, or a community, no human social group thought that the best way to help young people grow into responsible adults was to isolate them by law from responsible adults for 13 years. Separating the young from the old is really one of the greatest mistakes of modern education. For centuries, children were often around adults and often children around children of different ages. And, and, and we see this in Sudbury Valley schools. We see this in homeschooling where mixed ages really seem to make a big difference in, in, in how children learn. 
Now, universal compulsory schooling is a very recent development in human history, but we act as if it's the best way to help children grow. I agree wholeheartedly with Dr. Mintz's conclusion to Huck's raft. Above all, our society can provide the young with meaningful opportunities to contribute to their communities and provide the young with adult mentoring relationships. Young Huck needs Jim as he and his little raft brave the raging Mississippi. It seems simple enough to help, let's help children find their mentors. But in practice, school has diminished our imaginations and our actions to a point that most parents believe only professional teachers and professional buildings can help children learn meaningful things, namely what is on the current educational checklist. The origins of school are rooted in the Industrial Revolution, and the checklist approach works well for mechanical processes, but people are not machines. There is plenty of research that shows our brains do not develop like computers, but are more like rainforests that are startling, startlingly interconnected and work like ecosystems, or as Dr. Thomas Armstrong refers to them, brain forests. Nonetheless, we continue to push school processes and workplace needs over child development and community to marginalize parents and other adults from children's education because they are not properly certified or trained by school. Albert Einstein said, the problems that exist in the world today cannot be solved by the level of thinking that created them. This is why we need alternatives to school. We need policies, ways, and means that promote individual and intrinsic learning more and Universal, universal compulsory schooling less. Homeschooling or sending your child to an alternative of a private or public school are options that you can use to let your child grow with independence and to gain more responsibility than conventional school permits. But there are smaller steps you can take to make children welcome in your community, such as make sure your local park or other public places are child friendly, uh, including your favorite, um, your front yard. There's a wonderful book called Playborhood, uh, P-L-Y-B-O-R-H-O-O-D, that I recommend about ways that you can make your home and local community more inviting for children to play and be around. You can support a recess period of free play for children during school hours. They don't exist in most schools anymore. You can be welcoming of children and teenagers in your daily life rather than wary of them. You can fight daytime curfew laws that banish children from public places during business hours. <laughs> There's a lot of these. Homeschoolers constantly run up against these, these laws. You can support businesses and nonprofits that provide apprenticeships, internships, activities, and events for children outside of school. And finally, you can advocate for alternatives to school, not just more school. So the, that's my, my rationale for why we need alternatives to school. And now I'd like to uh, turn it over to you for your questions or your comments, um, your thoughts. I saw that there's a lot going on in the chat. So uh, is there anything there uh, that, that we should focus there's on? There's been a really rich discussion in the chat. Uh, if anybody who's participating in that would like to make a comment, you can. I'm going to give microphone privileges to everyone. You can either just click on the talk button, or you can raise your hand and we'll recognize you. Um, Tosca or... Julie, did either of you want to to raise an issue with Pat? Um, no, not raise an issue. I'm I'm really, first of all, really excited to be part of this conversation, and I hope you can hear me. I'm sorry, I'm in Bangkok and it's far away from you guys. Sounds um, great. But I, I'm I'm really um, honored to be part of this conversation. I think that Steve's right that educators need to work more closely with unschooling people part of that movement to understand where we are going and perhaps look at um, the way the future of education together as a team and maybe look and see ourselves on that same team. So that's that's where I think that we've failed as as teachers in the classroom. I was saying that in the chat that um, what you're saying doesn't resonate with me as a teacher because I work within the IB and I work within problem-based learning and inquiry-based learning and children directed and 
service learning, and we're on the cutting edge of gamification, et cetera. So there's a dissonance there, but I also understand what you're saying represents perhaps where you're coming from in your paradigm. So then, as teachers, what do we do to invite our community in to make what we're doing in the classroom more transparent, I guess, is what I'm talking about. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think the onus is on teachers, not our admin, not the governance, but actually individual teachers to leverage technology to bring people into our classrooms to see what's happening. So that's, that's kind of my, what I'm looking through my lens, you know. Um, but again, Pat, I'm so excited about what you're doing, and it's really cool to be here. So thanks for <laughs> letting me jump in on that chat. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate your comments. Uh, what sort of school do you teach at? Uh, I worked at New International School Thailand NIST uh, at the International Baccalaureate um, in Bangkok, Thailand. And before that, I was in Bonn. Before that, I was in China. Before that, I was in Korea. So I've worked always in an international context, uh, 15 years of being international. So I'm very blessed in that regard. Interesting, though. All those, all those countries have, are among the most rigid school systems on Earth. Uh, South Korea was in the New York Times a couple of days ago for, for <laughs> how, how the students are like committing suicide and stuff because the schools are so bad. Uh, what, what's your take on that? Are they yeah. bad and, and make it sound? Um, absolutely. Public school systems, I think, really need to be rethought. And I'm a big, um, you know, I'm a big supporter of public school only because I have so many friends that are public school educators in the United States that I went mm -hmm. to um, my master's program in George Mason. But I also think, you know, you're totally right. South Korea, very high suicide rate, unhappy children. But mm -hmm. within those systems, we have this alternative education happening, which is not really alternative because the IVs have been around since 1963 or something ridiculous. Oh, but I think that we need to leverage what we've been doing in the international community. And I think the one thing that really resonated with me was when you were talking about this elite structure of schooling. Totally agree. The IV is elite for the elite. So how do we level that playing field and how do we make that kind of education available for all of our learners and indeed all of our learning communities? Mm -hmm. All set. <laughs> uh, you, have, you have Maria waiting with her hand up and then you okay. have a question from Frank in the uh, chat. Let's go to Maria if we could. Hello. Can you hear Hi, me Maria. okay? Yes, I can. Excellent. Uh, thank you for this presentation pattern, for summarizing a lot of things. And I'll ask you the question I've been asking different people, and you addressed some of it. There are some communities that are already leaving the future that is here, but unevenly distributed. So there are some people, some communities or networks already doing what you propose here, reunited le living and learning, what, what we want to see. So you mentioned on schoolers and free schools. What mm -hmm. other communities you see as friendly and supportive of these ideas? I feel that any sort of community that's moving towards self-reliance um, is an ally. So, uh, for instance, uh, Early on um, in, in homeschooling, we and I still openly support La Leche League, you know, um, you know, natural uh, breastfeeding, because um, it, it, it's it, it, it's it's empowering you to use your your your, your natural resources and, and, and abilities and to take control um, of, of your life, um, and and so I would. I, I see them. I, 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 many of these uh, organizations that um, I was talking about earlier that, that are support services like um, Open Connections or, or North Star, you know, those are also other places that, that I would connect to. Um, you know, allies, we need to find as many allies and cast a wide net, I feel. And, you know, and, and Typically in education, you know, we want to specialize. And it seems like that's the way, you know, everyone, everyone wants to specialize and specialize. But 
I really feel that, that, that we need to cast a real generalist view on, on how we're going to grow this movement and, um, and really be widely open to, to everything because it, it touches a, a lot of things. And, and to just talk about education, well, people start citing studies. Oh, I mean, I've seen this, you know, where people say, oh, well, if you don't learn how to properly use an apostrophe, a possessive apostrophe when you're writing, by, if you don't learn to use that by, properly by third grade, studies show you won't learn to, to use it correctly for another five years. I mean, who cares? But these people, you know, we, we get that uptight by, by specializing and specializing. And I think that, you know, we need to cast a wide net and, and just you know, let education sort of take care of itself. That, yeah, there are specialists. You want your child to learn calculus? Let's find a, someone who uses or knows calculus and, and help them. But until that, that moment arrives when the, the child wants it, why not have them engaged with all these other uh, places that may not even, like, well, they like, they, like, they, they, they may, I, I know, like, um, you know, the, older kids like to take care of younger kids sometimes. You know, th that to me is a, a wonderful example. I mean, it, it doesn't have a, a lesson. It's, it's not in, in any um, curriculum. But that to me is vitally important. So I, I would say, Maria, that, that the more allies we can, can find that, that are about, self-reliance and, and helping us do things, um, you know, and, and building our, 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 our self-confidence and, and, uh, and, and trust among each other is much more important than buying a product or a service that, you know, that, that you use once and then is forgotten about. Pat, we've probably got time for one more question because we want to break before the next set of sessions. Frank had asked, what would your first three concrete steps be for educators to be to get started with new ways of doing education? Oh boy, good question. First, I get first. I would say, I mean, there are so many regulatory issues that would need to be dealt with, um, you know. But I, w I would have them first of all look at accreditation. Why is that? You know, what function is that serving? How, you know, I mean, you know, we know that homeschoolers have their accrediting agencies, private schools have theirs, public uh, charter schools, you know. I mean, why are we so hung up on being accredited and, um, and, and we, we could figure out other ways of proving that you've learned what you need to, to know to get a job done? I think that should take place at the job level, <laughs> at, the, at the triad, at the uh, entry level of, of, of any position rather than schools serving as sort of a, a human resources department for um, big business so that when you graduate, you've got that signal, oh, well, he's going to be a good employee, which we know is, 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 is not the case. So first of all, I'd look at accreditation, you know, because accreditation is driving the whole testing thing. And, you know, so all that to me is, it needs to be. Secondly, I would question the curriculum you know, as a teacher. You know, because most teachers that, that, that I speak with and that I know, they really do want to work with individual children. They understand that what's in a textbook is not necessarily what, what's going to engage the, a child. And so if they're creative they, and, they, and they feel that they have the time and the space, they can do this with students. But they don't feel that they can be creative and they don't feel that they have the time and the space. It's run school run. You know, we've got to cram all this information in before the test and so on. So I understand the problems that, that they have in school. So, so accreditation and curriculum. And then the third one would be to, to have, to let them be the bosses of their own classroom. The teacher should take the responsibility for what takes place in their classroom. And the, um, and the school should support that. Um, some, some teachers will be very strict, others will be loosey-goosey, you'll have people, you know, it'll be a wide range and, and children will be able, and families will be able to pick and choose based on what they, you know, the evaluations that, that other students and, and people have given and, you know, just on, on the results of their actions rather than the rating of the school on some real estate form somewhere that shows that it's a good school district. So those would probably be the three things I would do, Frank. 
So, Pat, we need to close. We have uh, three minutes for people to take a quick break before the next set of sessions. We have three great sessions coming up. We've got Clark Aldrich on the future of education depends on the success of homeschoolers and unschoolers. We have Julie Lindsay on learn with the world, global connection and authentic collaboration. And Gina Riley, a survey of 75 grown unschoolers. You've done a great job, Pat. You're a terrific co-chair. So, so appreciate you. I appreciate your work too, Steve. Thanks for getting this, this conference together as always. Thanks, Pat. I'm clapping for you. I hover over the smiley face now and go down to the applause button. It's hard to find. Thanks to Pat. Thanks to everybody for being here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to turn the recording off. You bet. You probably know the drill. You have to exit the room for the recording to process. Thanks, everybody. Hope you'll find some other good sessions. Take care, Steve. Bye. Yes, enjoy the conference. I look forward to more. Bye.